Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to wait just a minute or two more as people sign on. Hello, if you're just joining us, I have that it's just two o'clock, so we're going to give it just a couple more minutes to start. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, good morning, uh, and welcome to Stepping Up to Advance Racial Equity, One Step, One Policy Approach. Um, this webinar provides a walkthrough of the recently released document by the same title, as we support sites across the country familiar with the Stepping Up framework um, and how to use it and how it can be used to work and address equity issues in your jurisdiction. Needless to say, we are super excited uh, to provide this guidance and work with all of you in this important work. Next slide. Hello, everyone. I'm Risa Hanneberg. I'm Deputy Division Director on our Behavior Health Team at the Council State Government's Justice Center. And um, for those of you familiar with Stepping Up work, I've been involved with it since it launched um, in 2015. Also joining us today is Maria Fryer. Uh, she, Maria is the Policy Advisor with Criminal Justice and Mental Health at the Bureau of Justice Assistance with the Department, the U.S. Department of Justice. Also joining us, Kate Reed, Project Manager. I work with Kate at the Justice Center. And Orleni Rojas, Senior Manager at the Center for Effective Public Policy. CEPP has been working with us at the Justice Center, serving as a consultant uh, with us on this work. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Maria for some background about the work going on at BJA. All right. Thanks, Risa. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. So I'll start with an overview of the Office of Justice Programs. And the Bureau of Justice Assistance is located within the Office of Justice Programs, or we call OJP. OJP provides a wide range of services to the criminal justice community in the form of grants, training, technical assistance, and research. Other offices within OJP are those shown on the slide, and they offer additional grants and programs to support our shared public safety mission. Next slide. So BJA's mission, our mission is to assist states, tribes, and local governments to reduce and prevent crime 
We provide strategies and best practice approaches to promote fair and safe criminal justice systems. Communities can apply and receive grant funding and training and technical assistance that can benefit law enforcement, courts, correctional agencies, treatment providers, reentry practitioners, justice information technologists, and community-based partnerships to address the unique challenges in every community. Next slide. This is our director, uh, Director Carlton Moore, and he was appointed by President Biden in February of 2022. Director Moore leads BJA's programmatic and policy efforts and providing a wide range of resources, including, as I mentioned, training and technical assistance to law enforcement, courts, corrections, treatment, reentry, justice information sharing, and community-based partners to address chronic and emerging criminal justice challenges nationwide. Next slide. So the five major strategic focus areas of BJA on this slide, you can read more about the five primary strategic focus areas at BJA, many of which relate directly to the work in the grant programs that BJA administers. And these include a strategic focus on building trust and ensuring effective criminal justice systems, reducing recidivism and unnecessary contact with the criminal justice system, and of course, the utilization of confidence-based strategies, increasing program effectiveness and ensuring organizational excellence. Next slide. And finally, here you're viewing the key approaches that BJA takes to accomplish objectives in their strategic focus areas. Many of these st strategies are put into action through our grant programs, such as the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program and Connect and Protect Law Enforcement Behavioral Health Response Programs. Thank you again for being here. Now I'll kick it over to Teresa. All right, next slide, please. Thank you, Maria, and thanks to BJ for all the support in, in our work. So I just also wanted to share um, at the Justice Center, we also have a statement on equity and, and inclusion um, as we work uh, with you and with sites across the country um, that we are centering racial equity in our, in our research, in our products, and in our technical assistance. Also internally, just so you know that we have been working to make sure that we're upholding the values and um, you know that we're reflecting this pledge to this work. Next slide. So stepping up, uh, we just celebrated our eighth anniversary uh, here just a week or so ago, so excited for that. Uh, so we've been at it now for eight years, um, working to reduce the over-incarceration of people with mental illnesses and substance use disorders as they enter justice systems across the country. And we've been working with uh, NACO, the National Association of Counties and American Psychiatric Association as our partner organizations in this work. Next slide. And just a, uh, uh, just a quick run through here on this timeline of the Stepping Up work since we launched in 2018. You know, if you visited our website, if you have been involved with um, any of our work, you know that we have uh, produced um, quite, a, quite a library of webinars, uh, briefs, guidance, documents, um, and all this effort to work with, with sites to reduce and, and address the populations entering into the justice system that have behavioral health needs. Now in 2020, we moved forward, pushing sites to you know, really be able to drill down and more into their data and start to set targets as far as you know, demonstrating their work and accomplishments. I'm not sure 2020 was the best year to launch an initiative, um, but we did not know that <laughs> as we started. Um, so we've been at this now um, since 2020 and now adding into this um, the additional layer of um, the sites that are in a place to be able to access and get to their baseline data to also further um, look into their situation in terms of if disparities are occurring and how to increase in equity. Next slide. I'm going to turn it now over to Eleni for some background on the work. Thank you, Risa, and hello. I'm a senior manager at the Center for Effective Public Policy, CEPP, where we work with teams from local, state, and tribal jurisdictions to improve their justice systems and advance racial equity and community well-being. Last year, CEPP partnered with CSG to apply a racial equity lens to the Stepping Up initiative. As Stepping Up celebrates its eighth anniversary, it has an impressive list of accomplishments 
Still, we recognize inequities and disparities exist for people of color, particularly for Black and Indigenous communities at the intersection of behavioral health and the criminal justice system. Communities of color have experienced historical oppression and inequities that have left to multi-generational trauma. The Administration for Children and Families of the Department of Health and Human Services describes it as trauma experienced by specific cultural, racial, or ethnic groups stemming from slavery, racism, forced migration, and the violent colonization of Native Americans. These forms of oppressions play a role in social determinants of health, including economic stability, access to education and healthcare, as well as social context and community environment. And why this is um, particularly important is because a recent study published by the American Medical Association, GEMMA Network, showed that despite years of efforts to reduce health disparities, the black population in the United States experienced more than 1.63 million excess deaths and more than 80 million excess years of life loss compared to the white population over a 22 year period from 1999 to 2020. And the study found that lifestyles um, and exposures such as environments and traumas and how medical health systems treat people based on race had an impact more than anything else. Next slide. Uh, one thing that we'd like to note for you is that this brief was informed by the field um, earlier this year, we convened um, a focus group with stakeholders from five counties, Chatham, Georgia, Dauphine, Pennsylvania, Durham, North Carolina, Johnson County, Kansas, and um, Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. And um, we met with um, stakeholders from those counties to um, show them the brief, talk about it, get their impressions and reactions. And overall, what we found or what was shared is that they appreciated the explicit language about structural racism and white privilege um, that was included um, or featured in the brief uh, or called out and that um, the racial equity lens um, enhances or they find that it will enhance the stepping up framework that the framework provides a really great um, starting point to begin overlaying um, racial equity, um, that the brief will assist um, with racial equity conversations within their county. Uh, one in participant um, in particular mentioned that this brief was perf in perfect timing or coming at the perfect time because of current research projects on racial equity and disparities in their criminal systems. And so it would be helpful in those conversations and those efforts. And for some counties, um, data is a work in progress with an acknowledgement that a leap deeper look at racial disparities at the intersection with serious mental illness is needed. Uh, one county brought up that reading this brief made them think about working with our local public health department, uh, which has recently prioritized racial equity as part of their work. And that's um, another um, really great feedback piece that we got, how this uh, brief can help uh, you and counties um, that you work in really have these conversations with other parts um, of um, the system and, and the network outside of just behavioral health or um, the criminal justice system to really bring and build a coalition and collaboration. And in particular, uh, one county emphasized the effectiveness of meeting community members at their table rather than constantly holding sessions in an agency office and other people are holding community listening sessions and so really bringing um, back to the importance of engaging community in particular impacted community and people with lived experience um, in these efforts. Next. And last thing I'll say is that this brief lays a foundation to help counties increase racial equity by prioritizing and identifying and addressing racial disparities at the intersection of behavioral health and the criminal justice system, acknowledging and grappling uh, with disparities at this critical intersection that's already happening. And, 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 and we understand that counties are already um, doing this work or even thinking about or beginning to think about um, doing this work. Um, which is so important, and in particular, understanding that stepping up counties have the tools to address racial equity through policy, practice, and programmatic changes, and the justice involved Black, Indigenous, and people of color with serious mental illness experience disparities in the behavioral system and the criminal justice system, so there's that dual disproportionality and um, how we can improve public safety and enhance community well-being by addressing the disproportionality of uh, bike pub communities at this intersection. Now we'll turn it back to Risa to discuss um, the brief. 
Thank you, Arlene. So just a quick review of those original six questions. Um, and then we will move into uh, how we're applying now the racial equity lens. So just, you know, we'll go through these. Are, is your leadership committed? The timely screening and assessment process, gathering that baseline data, conducting process analysis and inventory of services, which for many locations is creating a sequ sequential intercept mapping exercise, prioritizing your policy practice and funding next steps, and then how you're gonna track your progress. Next slide. So let's start with question number one, is your leadership committed? So as we frame this now with that lens of racial equity, we're, we're saying that you know, this is the process of actualize, actualizing racial equity with committed representative leaders and planning team members. So if you've been at this a while, you've had you know, your same planning team or criminal justice advisory council or some whatever group that's been your core, team, it's time to maybe take a minute and step and look at, first of all, you know, is there that commitment there to do this work and that support from your higher levels of leadership? Um, some communities have actually um, issued a new resolution or, or new declaration that racism is a public health crisis. Uh, we're not saying you have to do that, but that's certainly one way of declaring that commitment to the work. Uh, really look at the composition of your team. Is it reflective of the composition of your community? Is it reflective of uh, the voice of lived experience and showing that there's diverse representation? I really want to spend a minute here on the role of the project coordinator. Many of you know I served in that role for many years in my home jurisdiction, and it can be a lonely spot because many times you're the only person doing that work of bringing together all of the key leadership and decision making bodies in this intersection. And then you're taking on now this rather um, it can be difficult and sensitive topic about, you know, pulling your data, identifying if there's disparities and being transparent in that work. And, you know, many times needing and making sure that that person has the support to push this project through. And then for each individual member on your teams to really take a minute to step back and provide some training on assessing their own personal biases and assumptions as we, as we lead into this work. Next slide. Do you conduct timely screen and assessment? So in the old stepping up process, this is where we really came in strong and heavy on making sure you're screening for serious mental illness right at the time of booking. But we're gonna push it back a step and really start to look at some of those very first questions that are asked in terms of identifying a person's race, race and ethnicity. Um, so this, this can be a little bit um, tricky when we start to do this, but um, it's important that you establish those definitions. You know, I'm going to just go ahead and say you're probably reliant on how in your jail management system this is being um, sorted out and, and being tracked. Um, but it's worth it to take a minute and look at what categories are being asked and, and, and tracked for. Um, because as you'll see in, in the next slide, that many of the breakouts that have quite honestly been out around for many, many years um, are maybe um, a bit stale or obsolete and not truly reflective of what are all the current choices and ways of reflecting race and ethnicity. Um, as we met with those focus groups that Orlini described, many were like, we don't do a good job, like right here at this juncture, we don't do a good job on tracking race and ethnicity. And it's kind of all over the place, if you will. Um, so like, we shouldn't even start this work. And we're saying, no, 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 start where you're at and use those, you know, make sure what your definitions are and what your categories are. And if you do make changes along the way that that's reflected in how you're tracking your data. Um, one other important step is to make sure that the individual that's being booked in is asked how they identify in terms of race and ethnicity and that it's not based on the assumptions of the person um, entering the information. And of course, we want all of this entered electronically um, so that we can then move forward with our data analysis. Next uh, slide. This is just a, a slide reflecting what are the uh, more traditional breakouts, um, if you will. Um, I do know from some of our research and the work we did that the Office of Management and Budget is actually also relooking these definitions currently and um, expecting them to roll out um, some new recommendations in, in time for the next round of census. I will say that many places will reflect that the category SOR or some other race many times is one of the highest 
you know, breakouts reported. And as you can guess, that's not super helpful um, in terms of, you know, moving forward with your analysis. Next slide. Question three is, do you have baseline data? So this is how we're really going to start to move a little further into the weeds than we have traditionally with the stepping up, um, establishing baseline data process. So we're going to be looking at three different data sets. And then for each of those data sets, applying the stepping up four key measures. So just a reminder to those of you who don't have those committed to memory, um, the first measure is tracking the number of bookings of individuals coming into your jail with serious mental illness. And then also being able to track and distinguish that average length of stay or AOLS for your population and connections to care. Um, that would be ensuring that a person at the time of discharge is connected to care and, and what their needs uh, will be in the community. And that is for the population that has screened positive or assessed as having SMI. And then tracking for the subsequent rebookings for that population. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to try to be clear and um, make this as simple as possible. I know a lot of people just start to get a little um, uncomfortable when we start digging into data, but it, it's really, I think, you know, will come naturally to you, especially if you've already been working with them, the guidance on, on data for stepping up. So as with traditional stepping up, you know, you're going to have the pull out your numbers between the general population that did not screen or assess positive for SMI. And then you're going to have your other breakout of the population that did screen positive or was assessed or diagnosed as SMI. And then you break out each of those uh, two data sets by those four key measures. This honestly is where stepping up has stopped in the past. So uh, we're hoping that all of you on uh, today um, are to this point in your data process. And if not, certainly to follow up with us and see how we can assist you. In addition to that, this is the juncture where you also want to pull out and look at the race and ethnicity breakdown for your entire jail population. And then also go to your county website or wherever you might go to find out what is your race and ethnicity breakdown for your jurisdiction. Because at the end, you're going to also be reflecting as to, you know, this population that we're looking at, is it reflective of, of, of your community or not? Next slide. Data set two, so you've already done the first round. So now we're gonna take each of those data sets. So your general population without SMI um, is disaggregated now by race and ethnicity. And then the jail population that did screen positive or was assessed with SMI is disaggregated by race and ethnicity. And then now you go through the process of breaking out those new data sets by the four key measures. So for example, you have your data set of the population in the jail that's green positive and they are BIPOC. And now you're trying to see from that information, you know, are they coming in more frequently? Are they staying longer? Are they connected to care? That's, that's where you're trying to get to this deeper level of, of data to, to help you in your work to reduce disparities. Okay, next slide. I feel like this is like, you know, extra credit. Uh, so <laughs> if you can get to those first two data sets, then, you know, that's really a great place to even rest for a minute, if you will, and, and do some analysis. So, but should you want to go deeper, you would take those data sets that you currently just dissected and now go one more layer and, and disaggregate by age and gender. And then those are going to probably be pretty small pieces of the pie. And then to then pull out, you know, the four key measures, you can start to see that it's going to get smaller and smaller, particularly if your jail population to begin with is fairly small. So be careful if you have um, the luxury of um, data analysts or research or somebody assisting with you, you know, they would be the best to advise you as like, no, you're, you're getting too small of a population of a data set here to make any kinds of generalizations. Okay, uh, next slide. And I am now turning it over to Kate. Thank you. Thanks, Risa. Uh, before we uh, dive in, um, my name is Kate Reed. I'm a project manager here at the Justice Center uh, on the Stepping Up team. 
And actually prior to joining the Justice Center, I, I led stepping up in Philadelphia. So I am very intimately familiar with what this hard work looks like on the ground. Um, and I just wanna say, I appreciate all of the work um, you all are doing to move to move this, this important work forward. Um, so question four really dives into the analysis of the data and really focuses on homing in on areas of opportunity to increase racial equity. So at this step, it's really important to first acknowledge and accept that racial disparities exist. They exist across all intercepts at every stage of the criminal legal system. Um, and there's also extensive research that supports that BIPOC individuals have poor outcomes at nearly all stages of the behavioral health system as well. Um, so just important to ground yourself in that research. Um, keep that in the back of your mind as you, you look at your data. Now this section outlines a three-tier approach uh, that will allow counties to more easily identify exactly where uh, to start tackling racial inequities. So the first step is aligning policies, practices, and programs with the four key measures. Um, and I'll explain what that looks like uh, using my work in Philadelphia as an example. So this was before COVID and we were still in the office and our planning team held a workshop um, we used the actual four walls of the room to represent each of the four measures. Um, I believe we used post-it notes and we had staff kind of go around the room and group existing uh, programs, policies, and practices under one or more of the measures. Um, and that was according to their potential impact um, on each measure. Um, I use this example in the brief. Um, so Philadelphia's pre-arrest diversion program, for example, would be categorized as a service that can uh, reduce the number of jail bookings uh, and also rebooking. So we would have put a post-it note on key measures one and four. So once the inventory of these programs, policies, and practices were grouped under each measure, the planning team then looked at the data sets for each measure to see where the biggest racial disparities were. Um, this really, really allowed the team to clearly identify where the opportunities were to address racial disparities um, and, and also have the most impact. Uh, so for another example, um, Philadelphia's BIPOC jail population with SMI had uh, significantly longer uh, average and median length of stay than their white counterparts with SMI. So we first flagged this for further investigation um, and that included focusing on the, you know, which policies, programs, and practices we, we posted under that, that length of stay measure. Um, so we, we literally looked at the wall um, after noting these glaring disparities in the data, and we, we saw all of the post-its so we could see right in front of us the potential programs um, and policies where, where we could actually address this. Um, I also want to add that if counties have program level data, um, or race and ethnicity data, you can absolutely use that uh, to further narrow your focus. So um, you know, for length of stay, you might have data for a ranchy program um, that can be taken into consideration. The second tier of this approach is identifying and assessing discretionary decision-making points. So we're really now shifting the focus to the decision makers within these, these programs. Um, you know, there are many places in the justice system where select few people have the authority to make decisions about a person's trajectory in the system. Uh, there's a ton of research out there supporting the notion that race plays a pretty big role in discretionary decision making. Um, Unfortunately, at many of those points, BIPOC individuals are at a disadvantage um, and increasingly so as they get deeper into the system. So this step is important and, and even more so um, when we're looking at the earlier, uh, earlier intercepts. <clears throat> so planning teams are, are encouraged to identify all of these discretionary decision-making points involved in your programs, policies, and practices, and then really assess you know, how those decisions are made, by whom and why, um, brainstorm ways to reduce discretionary authority. So that might include um, anything from implicit bias training uh, to, to implementation of a, a standardized decision-making protocol. So really just ensuring that decisions are based on objective criteria as opposed to, to subjective. Um, 
Now, word of caution, sometimes reducing discretionary authority can actually have the opposite effect. Um, so it's really important for you to follow up with your data um, and confirm that um, it is doing exactly what, what you want it to do. Um, and I, the last tier, the last tier of this process, this is a long process, um, is using a racial equity tool. And that allows you to conduct a, a deeper analysis of your identified policy, practice, or program. So racial equity tools really help center racial equity in a variety of situations, whether you're planning, developing, implementing, or, or evaluating programming. Um, they're essentially a set of structured uh, um, questions. The questions may vary, but they really uh, generally address um, these, these six different things. So the desired goals or outcomes, um, data analysis and tracking, uh, community engagement and involvement, analyzing the benefits, barriers, and burdens, plans to minimize harm and unintended consequences, and then also specific strategies to achieve racial equity. Now, there are a few racial equity tools that are actually available for, uh, for public use and can easily be found online. Uh, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GAIR, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, they developed a racial equity tool specifically for, uh, for government staff, um, elected officials, and other community-based organizations. And they really recommend that communities begin by using their toolkit, but then subsequently customize the questions based on, on local needs. Um, the brief provides uh, some links to these tools. Uh, I think Seattle has used one, I think since 2007. Um, Multnomah County in Oregon has one, um, and Madison, Wisconsin is another one. Um, so there are just a few, a few examples. Uh, next slide, please. And here are just some examples of questions you might find on a racial equity tool. And these are just things that, that you know, you can start thinking about. So which racial or ethnicity groups uh, may be most affected by the policy? Um, very important, have you informed, involved, and represented stakeholders from different racial and ethnic backgrounds? in the development of the program? Um, you know, what does your program want to accomplish? And will this goal actually reduce uh, disparities in any way? Um, and also are there better ways to advance racial equity? Um, what could be tweaked? What could be shifted to really make sure that there are positive impacts on equity and inclusion? Um, so again, just a few examples uh, in the brief. There are some links to these tools, so please feel free uh, to browse. Um, next slide, please. So after counties use a structured tool, they are they are pretty well positioned to pinpoint what improvements need to be made be made to whichever whichever policy, practice, or program they choose. So question five moves from analysis to actually making system improvements to increase racial equity. Um, and we have coined the phrase. Uh, we, we love it here at the Justice Center, um, the one step, one policy approach. You know, we've said throughout the brief, um, we've said throughout this webinar that this work can be overwhelming. Um, it can often feel like there needs to be a complete system overhaul. Um, but what we're really doing is encouraging counties to identify just one, just one policy program or practice change that you know not only has buy-in, but can also clearly demonstrate success and that that success can be can be easily built upon. Um, so this essentially means just breaking the work into smaller, uh, much more manageable pieces. So when selecting that, that one policy, uh, practice or program, um, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. You, you really should have adequate data to support the reform. You know, we all know data tells a story, and that story can be uh, very, very impactful, especially in this space. Uh, we also recommend that it be as, as close to politically neutral as possible. Um, it should have appeal to multiple different stakeholders on both the behavioral health and justice sides. Um, and it should be relatively easy to implement um, and low in cost. So basically, beginning with this low-hanging fruit, 
Um, I'm sure that's a phrase you've all heard before. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as the planning team moves toward implementation, um, you know, reforms are going to look different based on capacity, based on buy-in, um, based on resources. So these next two slides show uh, several different examples of strategies to address racial equity, and it's grouped by each of the four measures. Um, this list is not exhaustive by any means. These are just a few examples of potential system improvements to consider uh, after you collect and after you analyze your data. Um, so for key measure one, reducing jail bookings, uh, one major strategy being talked about quite a bit is uh, implementing community responder programs, especially in underinvested and marginalized areas. Um, if you think about it, you know, if you don't send police, the likelihood of someone with an SMI in crisis being booked into jail uh, is, is going to be much lower. Um, for key measure two, reducing length of stay, um, one strategy involves equitable access to diversion or specialty court programs. So, you know, looking at who is being referred, uh, who is being accepted, does it match the, the demographics of your, of your jail population? Um, what are the criteria used for acceptance into these programs? Um, so Risa will actually share a real life example of this in, in a few minutes. Um, next slide. Key measure three, uh, connections to care. Again, we're looking at who is getting referred to treatment, to housing and other services when they are reentering the community. Um, is it equitable? Uh, in Philadelphia, actually, um, they did some work around this one. Their, their data showed that they were referring and accepting uh, more white individuals with SMI to reentry housing than, than BIPOC individuals with SMI. Um, even though the proportion of BIPOC uh, to white with SMI in the jail was much greater. Um, so in essence, in this case, to advance racial equity, the race and ethnicity breakdown of the referrals and placement were reviewed closely by a team, and they were adjusted to make sure that they matched that of the jail SMI population. Um, key measure four, rebookings. Both of these are really great examples. Um, I think cultural responsivity, um, which is essentially addressing specific cultural needs and, and circumstances of an individual. Um, this is a great strategy across all key measures. Um, and I also want to note that implicit bias and anti-racism training is also a strategy that can be implemented with all agencies across all systems. Next slide. And finally, question six, we are moving from implementing system improvements to measuring and tracking progress. Now, tracking progress, consistently tracking progress is very important in terms of making sure you're on the right track and, and truly advancing racial equity. Uh, you can follow stepping up set measure achieve process to do this. Um, so first by setting your baselines um, based on the identified disparity and then setting specific targets uh, for your desired level of improvement. And so counties can use the Stepping Up uh, um, Set Measure Achieve Progress Survey um, that is online. Um, and you can consistently track metrics and that even includes uh, racial equity measures. The only downside um, is it does not support additional data breakdowns at this point. So for example, if you really wanted to do that extra credit um, data set, um, and you wanted to break it down by age and gender, you wouldn't be able to do so. Um, but if your county wants to do this and has the resources, um, we recommend working with specialized staff like, uh, like data scientists. Um, that's a great, great solution and a huge benefit. Um, the last thing I want to note is uh, you know, tracking should absolutely involve qualitative data uh, in addition to the quantitative. Uh, BIPOC members of your planning team with lived experience um, in both the justice and behavioral health systems should really be consulted on the numbers. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the data matches real life experience to paint a more complete um, and, and a more powerful picture. Uh, so I'm going to, um, you can go to the next slide. 
And I will turn it back over to Risa um, to talk a little bit about our spotlight um, in, in Indianapolis. Thanks, Kate. So um, Indianapolis, uh, which is Marion County, and they are a combined um, city county jurisdiction, um, what has been a uh, justice and mental health collaboration um, project site um, through the years, and one that I was providing technical assistance uh, to as they were implementing a lovely brand new diversion center there in, in Indianapolis. Um, and they did a really great job of looking at their data and the early assessment showed that law enforcement officers were not uh, frequently referring people to their new AIC or assessment and innovation center for a diversion. So not bringing them to the jail, but taking them over to their brand new AIC program. Um, so, and I just want to start out by saying this was somewhat across the board. Police were just choosing to take folks to jail. Um, and I mean, sidebar, we see that happen, that it takes a while sometimes for new programming to become, you know, routine and used effectively um, by law enforcement. Um, but what the um, ultimate result was, is that as they, as they were doing that, then they were also just by nature of not taking everyone that who ended up in the AIC was not reflective of their community's uh, demographics and their breakout. So what they did in their approach, well, it was multi, you know, leveled in terms of, you know, they went back to the top decision makers. So they went to the sheriff and the police chief and said, you've, you know, really got to, you know, enforce that, you know, that, that individuals should first be taken to the diversion center and processed. And so once they started doing that and it was, you know, implemented uniformly, then you would start to see that those numbers started shifting more towards being reflective of the population that would have been in jail and also that in the community. So it was a little bit of that top down pressure combined with we will make this as easy as possible for you law enforcement, you know, this one stop you know, shop thing, well, you only need to be here for a few minutes, we will have treats for you or whatever you need while you're at the facility. Also demonstrating that the program was going to effectively connect the individuals to programming and supports in the community so that police would not be feeling like it was a revolving door situation and that, and that you know, they were really um, doing a, a good job there and providing those services and therefore decreasing the repeat contact with law enforcement. So that's a little um, story uh, from Indianapolis. Uh, we feature it in our in our document, and um, you know, just it's one of those examples of you really do need to track your data after you implement your program. Kate, I think it's back to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Risa. Um, you know, we acknowledge that counties are at various stages of this work. Um, some are further along than others. And at the Justice Center, we, we wanna help you get started or help you advance and, and support this work as much as we possibly can. So there are a few things coming up that are worth mentioning. Um, first, we have a racial equity community of practice coming up. Um, applications have been extended and I believe they are now due June 1st. Uh, there will be four sessions that will run from mid-June to the end of September. And this is really an opportunity for, for counties to start digging into the work, um, apply the process steps in real time um, with our support and CEPP's support as well. We're very lucky to have CEPP as a partner um, on, on all of these projects. Um, also, you know, we have this brief, obviously, um, and we have an update of the six questions document forthcoming as well. So, that document re reiterates much of what is in the brief, but it is um, more integrated uh, and, and more concise. Um, and then lastly, we have a survey that is out already that your county can participate in. It's really an opportunity to voice what some of your needs might be in this space. Um, and that helps us figure out how to best um, support you. Um, I'm happy to send out that survey link uh, after this webinar is over. And I think I saw a flash of a question um, where we can find uh, the link to the COP. Um, I can send that out as well um, to all the participants, um, if that's helpful. Um, 
Okay, so I, I think um, before I turn it back over to Orleni uh, to wrap us up, um, it's worth mentioning that we are also very much focused on incorporating the voices of, of lived experience into the Stepping Up framework. Um, so we're working with C4 Innovations to bring together a lived experience advisory panel. And that's um, comprised of folks across the country who have firsthand experience with um, the behavioral health and the justice systems. Um, so they will be working together to sort of develop a roadmap for how we can best um, how we can best weave personal experience into the stepping up framework. Uh, they will also be releasing some guidance and best practices for how counties can do this as well. Uh, C4 and our team uh, will also be conducting a survey. Uh, as well as focus groups to glean additional insights and information. So we'll have much more to come on that um, in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, Orleni, I will turn it over to you um, to close us out and uh, to take any questions. I think we have um, a little bit of time for questions, so. Great, yes, thank you. And so as it's been mentioned here um, throughout this webinar, it is critically important to act to address racial equity and racial disparities in this space. Centering racial equity requires partnership and collaboration across different sectors. However, behavioral health and justice system stakeholders can begin to address racial disparities and the overrepresentation of BIPOC uh, people in their systems. And this brief provides tools and guidance to help you achieve um, those ends. So as we, as you see in the slide here, stepping up can help counties take action towards increasing racial equity. Um, structural racism operates in many domains and uh, we must address other social determinants of health, such as housing, food security, financial stability, health, um, healthcare access. And so also doubling down on the one step or one policy um, approach. Um, if you don't have, you know, to start with that um, commitment from leadership, if um, there are lack of resources, if you're finding um, opposition, you know, no step is a small step. I think that you have to have any or take any action um, that you can. And for example, um, in jurisdictions that I've worked with where there is um, a lack of buy-in uh, and to some extent, even some resistance around um, racial equity, racial disparities, and beginning to look into that and address it and build strategies, um, we've looked inward into what can this agency, what can this um, group of people that we're working with, what can they do? It can be as simple as starting a protocol internally um, for collecting um, race and ethnicity data. And we've seen that when someone takes action and begins doing something and that something is leading or having a positive impact, other people take notice of that. And that brings them to the table. That um, shows them that there's something um, that you can do, that there is a value to what you are doing. And that's another way to um, get buying and, and build um, commitment and consensus. It's just by taking a small step, by taking action. Um, as you've heard, we have counties that are very well advanced. And that's also um, something to take advantage of. Uh, reaching out and speaking to counties that are or have done the thing, that have gotten these huge processes off the ground and are really um, making strides. Like, you know, connect with them, find out what, uh, how they got through a particular um, challenge or barrier or process. I think that when it comes to this topic, it, what we want to foster is um, a sense or an environment of doing something because in action, um, just has such a toll on the people that we are focusing on and BIPOC communities. And that's really um, something that we don't want to continue um, to foster or to continue to remain in the status quo. Any sort of action can really get the ball starting. And that's really um, how this brief or the best value that I see and that we see in this brief is that it can provide that tool. It can get you started at different levels and no step is too small. So now I know that we have um, questions, but if there are other questions, um, we'll open it up. Um, I'll jump in because I see we have a question. 
um, from our friend Cynthia. Um, and she always has tough data questions. So, um, so I'm just gonna, so let me just, um, I don't know if y'all have read her question, um, but you know, that's in a, a, one of those wonderful um, data specialist positions, data science, do you have suggestions for jurisdictions that have very small numbers in the category for um, data, data set two, which is the BIPOC plus SMI? And um, when we start to unpack further along the four key measures, so, you know, you're slicing them, that same data set four different ways, um, you know, specifically connections to care, the numbers get so small, we aren't sure how to proceed, what conclusions to make. So um, my disclaimer is I, I'm not, you know, a research expert, but I really think that that sounds similar to the situation that Indianapolis faced, not saying that their data set was really small. It's just that when you saw that a policy was not being equally applied, you know, they went back and, you know, the directions that the police chief and the, and the sheriff gave was everybody's going to the AIC, right? And so, you know, that way it's equitable and there's, you know, how it turned out before was more white people ended up in their AIC. But if you have this directive that everybody goes through the diversion process at the new center first, you know, you'll start to equalize, um, you know, all rise, all rising at the same level. But, you know, certainly when you're starting to see those differentiations and disparities and you're saying, well, it's a really small population, it's probably almost to the case then that it's getting so small, right, that I bet somebody knows this individual. You can talk to the probation officer. You can talk to the mental health caseworker. I mean, you can start to, you know, kind of build a profile of what even that small data set of population is starting to look like and really what those needs might be. And I think you said it was under average length of stay that you were looking at and connections to care. So, you know, what is what is creating this disparity there that individuals, people of color, cannot get into that pro program and are not being connected to care? Um, start to just kind of dig down into what Kate said, the importance of some of the qualitative data as well as the quantitative. I don't know. I'll let anybody else jump in. Yeah, if I can, I think that um, at first glance, you want to see if is it really that you just have a small population within your county that's impacted or affected um, that are uh, members of the BIPOC community? Or is it that you have an underrepresentation of them in connections to care, meaning that they're, as Risa mentioned, they're not getting access to it. And it gives you the opportunity then to look at other areas. It could also be an opportunity to identify, are you capturing the information? Um, and that's maybe why the numbers are smaller and you may need to start looking at how do you capture what is actually happening and what the actual um, population is. Um, but absent that, if it continues to be small, it's really then looking um, towards um, that qualitative, um, you know, digging down uh, of information gathering that you can do. Any other questions before we um, close the webinar? I am just going to give a shout out. Um, I saw a question in there about how do you get the application for the COP? We'll we'll get that out to all of the attendees. Um, don't let the application form be a stopper. Um, you know, because we we you know we're really looking forward to um, having this opportunity and, and offering it and. Honestly, selfishly, we we want to learn from you as much as we want to be able to um, you know guide and assist you because um, you're this is really sort of a frontier, if you will, and uh, we really want to see you know what gets uncovered, what you all find, and, and what you all start to recommend for that implementation process. Anyone else want to close out before we go? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to double down on what um, Kate mentioned. We do have this survey um that we're doing and it's really going to help inform uh it's really listening from you uh and folks doing this work um to inform how uh, future guidance future resources future training um can really hone in on, on what people really uh, need um 
to to get this going and, and to overcome barriers, but also to highlight um, your successes as well. And so I was going to um, drop that link here in the chat and just encourage uh, people to go there and take the survey. Thanks, Teresa. And I'll just add that BJA does a lot of listening um, from communities, and that's the best way to provide meaningful training and technical assistance as well. So thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day and a lovely holiday weekend ahead. Thank you.